there are five things wrong with the Gen 5 Glocks. Four are carryovers from earlier generations, but one <laughs> is a Gen 5 exclusive, more or less. Before I get into them, I want you to know that I consider myself to be a Glock fan. The very first pistol I ever bought was a Gen 2 G20 back in 1992. And within months, I actually used it to defend myself against an armed carjacker. Ever since, I've carried a Glock almost exclusively as my concealed carry piece. But in the past 25 years, a good number of pistols have entered the market that provide the same point and shoot simplicity and reliability that make me like Glocks so much. And it's in comparison to those other options that I made this list. Number one, plastic sights. The Gen 5 still come with plastic sights standard. In 47 years, there are only two kinds of guns that I bought that come with plastic sights standard, Glocks and square guns. This is a $99 BB gun. It comes with metal sights. This Gen 5 G19, which I got from Brownells, MSRP is over $600 but it's gonna come with plastic sights. Law enforcement and military contract purchasers specify no plastic sights for a reason. They know they have no business being on a fighting handgun. And that's why they have no business on a gun sold to people for self-defense. That said, Glock did a good thing by upgrading their night sight version with the Mariglow Spartans, which are great sights for day or night use. They're steel and it's only gonna cost you another $35 from this version with the plastic sights. If you have no preference for aftermarket sights, or you're someone who's just gonna buy a Glock and use whatever sights are on it, I highly recommend you spend an extra $35 on the night sight version of the Gen 5. You'll never get as much value out of $35 of upgrades to your Glock once you buy it. Number two, the Glock hump is still there. Why is that hump a problem? Well, it has to do with muscle memory that we've been developing since we were babies. When we point, our wrist is straight. It's anatomically neutral. And if you put a gun with a straight back strap in your hand, just the same wrist angle as if you were pointing, that muzzle is gonna be pointing pretty much at the target. You put a gun in your hand with a Glock hump, and by the way, Glock is not the only manufacturer that puts a Glock hump on the back of their polymer pistol anymore, but that hump pushes the muzzle upward. And so you have to train yourself to lower the muzzle onto the target from what would be your anatomically neutral wrist angle. I've been shooting Glocks for 25 years, so that muzzle position is perfectly natural for me, but it sure would be a whole lot easier if people didn't have to train outside of what they've already trained for their entire life just by pointing. I realize Glock can't do away with that Glock hump. They need continuity between generations so that their contract purchasers don't have to retrain all their people as they move from one generation to the next. But other manufacturers have shown us we can have it both ways in one gun. FN, for example, includes a straight back strap as well as a humped back strap with the FNS9. Even a Walter PPK M2 and HK VP9 give you the option between small humps and large humps, there's plenty of room behind the actual magwell in the Gen 5 Glocks to offer a straight back strap as the standard grip. And then Glock could add that hump back in for people who want it with the attachable back straps it already includes with every pistol. Number three, it still has a puny slide stop. Yes, it's ambidextrous, but it's still very small in comparison to the slide stops that are available on other competing pistols. Slide stops that are designed to be more easily used as a slide release. I realize some of you are going apoplectic right now because you should never use a slide stop as a slide release, or at least that's what you think. But there are plenty of people out there who have made a living surviving gunfights where they have to reload as somebody's shooting at them who have decided that they are going to teach people to use the slide stop as a slide release on a Glock. The last pistol class I took was three days of somebody teaching me exactly that. Someone who spent a lot of time on the wrong side of the muzzle whose opinion I respect. Regardless of where you fall in this debate, I hope you appreciate why I think Glock should still offer a slightly extended slide stop as standard for those Glock purchasers who've made an informed decision and who train to use the slide stop as a slide release. Number four, a complete lack of front slide serrations. And I realize this is probably just as controversial as talking about the slide stop 
being used as a slide release. Many instructors feel you should never put your hands at the front of your slide because it's too close to the muzzle. Many of the same instructors think you shouldn't be doing press checks anyway. The Glock has a loaded chamber indicator that you can determine by feel whether or not you have a round in the chamber very reliably without taking your eyes off the environment in front of you. You can do it in the dark and you're not going to induce a malfunction like you can by doing a press check. I find myself in that camp. Those are the kinds of instructors that I have had. However, none of that matters because we know a very large number of Glock customers want front slide serrations because there's a massive industry based upon milling factory Glock slides so people get those front slide serrations. Glock itself knows enough of its customers want that that they made special edition Gen 4s just this summer with nothing added except for front slide serrations done right at the factory, which is where it should be done before the hardness treatment of the melanite, tenifer, whatever you want to call it. Glock shouldn't be making its customers send their slides off to somebody else to get those slide serrations cut in after that hardening treatment has already been done. They're going to be without their gun for however long that takes. It adds cost to the ownership experience and almost every competitor that the Glock either has front slide serrations or a contour that gives you the same effect. Number five, the front magwell cutout. Looks like the cutout that's found on Gen 2 frames, but it's actually cut significantly higher. And this is probably why I've experienced two problems shooting this Gen 5 G19 that I never experienced shooting a Gen 2 G19. The first problem with that cutout isn't a big deal, but as you can see, my pinky wraps right around and I can feel that edge very well in the skin of my pinky. Now, I had to shoot a couple hundred rounds before it really became barely a distraction, if you will. I don't have the biggest of hands, but there are people who have even smaller hands, and I can see how somebody who has an even smaller grip than I have, if you have your pinky pad right in there, you're not going to like it. There are companies that are going to be coming out with base plates that will fill in that gap, but that doesn't solve the second problem that this creates. To me, the biggest problem with the cutout has to do with what it does to the magwell. Glock took all the effort to flare and bevel the size of the magwell, and then they cut away the most important part of a flared magwell, the front. Here's the problem. You can see right here, that is the proper magazine angle. You get that angle and it goes in just fine. All you have to do is get it off a few degrees, and then look at that. The front edge of the magazine catches on the inside of that cutout. It's just a few degrees off. And if you think you're going to be able to tell the difference between that and that, under stress of fire, someone's trying to kill you and you're trying to reload, you've got to be kidding yourself. This is not an issue of training. This is an issue of a design that you have to train around so you don't end up in a situation where you're trying to reload and instead of that flared magwell helping you out, it actually directs the magazine right into that cutout and slows you down. Even though I think Glock should have addressed those five things in developing the Gen 5 Glocks, I still think they got a lot right. The first four things are issues I've dealt with for 25 years of owning Glocks, and it's not gonna be that different with the Gen 5. The fifth thing is new to the Gen 5, for me at least, and I'm gonna spend a lot of time practicing reloads to see if I can eliminate that as a concern. Regardless, I am gonna be doing a lot of shooting with this gun before I put it in rotation as a concealed carry piece, if I do at all, just like anybody should do with a brand new gun, especially a brand new design like the Gen 5. Be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram. You can see the links right here. And be sure to click right here to subscribe so you can catch my next videos on bows, guns, and other cool things like this Gen 5 G19. I really appreciate you watching Twang and Bang, and I hope to see you next time.